not one of you here who does not envy this logical thinking of mine. Yet now, I honestly and sincerely declare before you all that, regarding this question of the beyond, I, with all the knowledge accumulated in me, am neither more nor less than an idiot cube. At this moment in the city of Babylon what is taking place among us is the collective building of a tower by which to ascend to heaven and see with our own eyes what goes on there. This tower is being built of bricks that outwardly all look alike, but that are made of quite different materials. Among these bricks are bricks of iron and wood and also of dough and even some of eider down. Well then, with these bricks an immensely high tower is now being built right in the center of Babylon, and every more or less conscious person must realize that sooner or later this tower is certain to fall and crush not only all the people of Babylon but also everything else there. Personally, as I still wish to live, and have no desire to be crushed by the Babylonian tower, I am going away from here at once. And as for all the rest of you, do as you please. He uttered these last words while leaving, and ran off. And from that time, I never saw that likable Assyrian again. As I learned later, he left the city of Babylon that same day forever, and went to Nineveh, and existed somewhere there to a ripe old age I also ascertained that this Hamelinadir never again occupied himself with sciences, and spent the rest of his existence in growing chingri, which in contemporary language is called maize. Well, my boy, the speech of this Hamelinadir at first made such a deep impression upon the beings there that for almost a month they went about, as is said, down in the mouth. Single quote. And when they met one another, they could speak of nothing else, but only recalled and repeated various passages from his speech. They repeated them so often that certain of Hamelinadir's expressions spread among the ordinary beings of Babylon and became what are called household sayings. Some of these sayings have even reached contemporary beings of the planet Earth, and among these is the building of the Tower of Babel. So the beings of today picture to themselves quite clearly that once upon a time a certain tower was built in this city of Babylon to enable beings to ascend in their planetary bodies to God himself. And the contemporary beings also say, and are even quite persuaded, that during the building of this Babylonian tower a confusion of tongues occurred. In general, there have reached the contemporary beings of the planet Earth a great many such isolated expressions, uttered by various beings with reason of former epochs, both from the time when Babylon was the center of culture and from other epochs, concerning some details of a whole understanding, and simply on the basis of these scraps, your favorites of recent centuries, with their quite nonsensical reason, have cooked up such balderdash as our arch-cunning Lucifer himself might envy. As I already told you, among the many teachings then current in Babylon concerning the question of the beyond, there were two, having nothing in common with each other, that had a large number of adherents. And it was precisely these two teachings, passing from generation to generation of your favorites, which began to confuse their sane being mentation already muddled enough without that. Although the details of both these teachings underwent changes in the course of their transmission through the generations, 
the fundamental ideas contained in them remain the same and have even reached contemporary times. One of these two teachings with adherents in Babylon was the dualistic, and the other, the atheistic. Thus one of them proved that beings have a soul, and the other, quite the opposite, namely, that they have nothing of the kind. In the dualistic, or idealistic, teaching it was said that within the coarse body of the being man there is a fine and invisible body, which is the soul. This fine body of man is immortal, that is to say, it is never destroyed. It was said further that this fine body, or soul, has to make a corresponding payment for every action of the physical body, whether voluntary or involuntary, and that every man, at birth, already consists of these two bodies, the physical body, and the soul. Single quote. According to this teaching, as soon as a man is born, two invisible spirits perch upon his shoulders. On his right shoulder sits a spirit of good, called an angel, and on his left, a spirit of evil, called a devil. Single quote. From the very first day these spirits record in their notebooks, all the manifestations of the man, the spirit sitting on his right shoulder recording all his so-called good manifestations, or good deeds, and the spirit sitting on his left shoulder, his evil ones. It is among the duties of these two spirits to prompt a man and compel him to carry out as many manifestations as possible in their respective domains. The spirit on the right constantly strives to make the man refrain from those acts which are in the domain of the opposite spirit, and perform as many acts as possible in his own domain. And the spirit on the left is the same thing, but vice versa. In this strange teaching it was further said that these two rival spirits are always contending with each other, and that each strives with might and mind to make the man perform more of those actions which are under his charge. When the man dies, these spirits leave his physical body on the earth and take his soul to God, who exists somewhere up in heaven. There, up in heaven, this God sits surrounded by his devoted angels and archangels, with a pair of scales suspended in front of him. On each side of the scale spirits stand on duty on the right stand the spirits who are called servants of paradise, and these are the angels, and on the left stand the servants of hell, these are the devils. The spirits who have been sitting on the man's shoulders all his life bring his soul after death to God, and God then takes from their hands the notebooks, where the notes of all the man's actions have been written down, and places them on the pans of the scales. On the right hand he puts the notebook of the angel and on the left the notebook of the devil and, depending on which pan sinks lower, God commands the spirits on duty on that side to take this soul into their charge. In the charge of the spirits on duty on the right is the place called paradise. This paradise is a realm of indescribable beauty and splendiferousness. It abounds in magnificent fruits, and innumerable fragrant flowers. Enchanting sounds of cherubic songs and seraphic music constantly echo in the air. And many other marvels were enumerated whose outer effects, according
according to the perceptions and cognitions abnormally inherent in the three brain beings of that strange planet. We're likely to evoke, as they say, great satisfaction, in them, that is, the satisfaction of those needs that are unworthy of free centered beings, which drive from their presence everything, without exception, that was put into it by our common father which is imperative for every free brain being to possess. The spirits on duty to the left of the scales, who, according to this Babylonian teaching, are the devils, are in charge of what is called hell. As for hell, it was said to be a place without a trace of vegetation, always unimaginably hot, and without a single drop of water. In this hell, there constantly echo sounds of frightful, cacophony, and furious, insults. All around stand instruments of torture of every conceivable sort, from the, rack, and, wheel, to machines for, lacerating bodies, and rubbing them with salt, and so on and so forth. In this Babylonian, idealistic, teaching, it was explained in detail that for his, soul, to enter, paradise, a man must constantly strive while on earth to provide as much material as possible for the, notebook, of the spirit angel perched on his right shoulder, since otherwise there would be more material for the record of the spirit on his left shoulder, in which case his soul would inevitably be cast into that most awful, hell. Single quote quote. Here Hassan could restrain himself no longer, and suddenly interrupted Beelzebub with the following words. And which of their manifestations did they consider good and which bad? Beelzebub gave his grandson a very strange look and, shaking his head, replied. As regards the question of which being manifestations are considered good on your planet, and which bad, too. Distinct ways of understanding, having nothing in common, have existed from the most ancient times up to the present day. The first way of understanding exists there and passes from one generation to another through such three brain beings as were the members of the learned society of Octans on the continent of Atlantis, and through such as those who, several centuries later, after the second Transapalnian perturbation, were beginning, although in a different manner, to acquire almost the same data in the foundation of their common presence, and who were called, initiates. This way of understanding is expressed there as follows. Every deed of a man is good in the objective sense if it is done according to his conscience, and every deed is bad if from it he later experiences remorse. And the second way of understanding arose soon after the wise invention of the great King Koniachin, and, passing from generation to generation through ordinary beings there, it gradually spread over almost the entire planet under the name of morality. Single quote. Here it will be interesting to note one particularity of this morality which was grafted onto it at the very beginning, and ultimately became part and parcel of it. Just what this particularity of terrestrial morality is you can easily represent to yourself and understand if I tell you that both inwardly and outwardly, it has acquired the unique property that belongs to the being named, chameleon. 
and the strangest and most original aspect of this particularity of the morality there, especially of the contemporary morality, is that its functioning automatically depends on the moods of the local authorities, and these moods in their turn depend, also automatically, on the state of the four sources of action existing there under the names of mother-in-law, digestion, John Thomas, and cash. Single quote. The second Babylonian teaching, which had many followers and, passing through the generations also reached her contemporary favorites, was based on one of the atheistic theories of that period. In this teaching of the terrestrial Hasmamusian candidates of that time, it was stated over and over again that there is no God in the world, much less any soul, in man, and that therefore all the arguments and discussions about the soul, are nothing but the delirium of sick visionaries. It was further maintained that there exists in the world only one particular law of mechanics, according to which everything that exists passes from one form into another, that is to say, the results arising from any preceding causes are progressively transformed and become the causes of subsequent results. And therefore man also is a result of some preceding cause and in his turn must serve as the cause of some kind of result. Moreover, it was said that all supernatural phenomena, even those actually perceptible to most people, are also nothing but results ensuing from this particular law of mechanics. The full comprehension of this law depends on the progressive, impartial, and all-round knowledge of its manifold details, which can be revealed to a pure reason in proportion to its development. But as regards the reason of man, this is merely the sum of all the impressions he has perceived, from which there gradually arise in him data for the possibility of comparisons, deductions, and conclusions. As a result of all this, he obtains more information concerning various facts around him repeatedly occurring in the same way, which in their turn serve in the general organization of man as material for the formation of definite con fictions. And from all this is formed man's reason, that is to say, his own subjective psyche. Whatever may have been said in these two teachings about the soul, and whatever maleficent means were prepared by those learn, beings, assembled there from almost the entire planet, for the gradual transformation of the reason of their descendants into a veritable mill of nonsense, the outcome need not have been, in the objective sense, a total calamity, but the full objective terror lay in the fact that there later resulted from these teachings of great evil, not only for their descendants, but maybe even for everything that exists. The point is that during this great agitation of minds in the city of Babylon, when these learned beings, through their collective wise offerings, had acquired in their presences a mass of new data for Hasnamusian manifestations, in addition to those they already had, and when they dispersed and went home to their own countries, they began, of course unconsciously, to propagate everywhere, like contagious bacilli, all those notions which together finally and utterly destroyed the last remnants and even the traces of the results of the holy labors of the very saintly Ashiata Shemash. The remnants, that is to say, of those holy labors, 
consciously suffered, which he intentionally actualized in order to create the special external conditions of ordinary being existence in which alone the maleficent consequences of the properties of the organ Kundabuffer could gradually disappear from the presence of your favorites, so that in their place there could gradually be acquired those properties befitting every free brain being, whose whole presence is an exact likeness of the whole universe. Another result of the diverse wise actrings on the question of the soul, by those, learn, beings in the city of Babylon was that, soon after my fifth appearance in person on the surface of your planet, this center of culture, of theirs, the incomparable and indeed magnificent Babylon, was in its turn, as is said there, completely swept from the face of the earth, down to its very foundations. Not only was the city of Babylon itself destroyed but also everything acquired and accomplished by the beings who had existed there for many of their centuries. Justice I must say here that the prime initiative for the destruction of the holy labors of Ashiata Shemash did not spring from those learned terrestrial beings then assembled in the city of Babylon, but rather from the invention of a well-known, learned, being who had existed on the continent of Asia several centuries before these Babylonian events his name was Lentroham Sanan, and this being, whose highest being part is coded into a definite unit and perfected to the required gradation of objective reason, became one of those 313 eternal Hazimus individuals who now exist on the small planet bearing the name of Retribution. Single quote. I shall tell you more about this Lentroham Thanon, since the information about him will help you to understand better the strange psyche of those three brain beings who exist on that peculiar remote planet. But I shall speak of Lentroham Thanon only after I have told you all about the very saintly Ashiata Shemash. Since the information about this now most saintly individual and his activities in relation to this planet of yours is of the utmost importance and value for deepening your understanding of the strangeness of the psyche of the three brain beings who please you and who breed on the planet Earth. Quote, Chapter 25 The very saintly Ashiata Shemash sent from above to the Earth. And so, my boy, now listen very attentively to the information I will give you about the very saintly, now common cosmic individual, Ashiata Shemash, and his activities connected with the three brain beings arising and existing on that planet Earth which has taken your fancy. I have already told you more than once that, by the all-gracious command of our infinitely loving common Father Endlessness, our highest and most saintly cosmic individuals sometimes actualize within the presence of some terrestrial free brain being the definitized conception of a sacred individual, in order that, having become a terrestrial being with such a presence, he might comprehend the situation on the spot and give a suitable new direction to the process of the ordinary being existence of your favorites, thanks to which there could perhaps be removed from their presences the already crystallized consequences of the properties of the organ Kundabuffer, as well as the predisposition to new crystallizations. It was just seven centuries before the Babylonian events of which I have spoken that there was actualized in the planetary body of a three-brain being there the definitized conception of a sacred individual named Ashiata Shemash, who became in his turn a messenger from above, and who is now one of the highest and most saintly common cosmic sacred individuals.
The conception of Ashiata Shemash took its form in the planetary body of a boy of poor family descended from what is called the Sumerian race, in a small village called Hispaskana, situated not far from Babylon. He grew up and became a responsible being partly in this village and partly in Babylon itself which, although not yet magnificent at that time, was already a famous city. The very saintly Ashiata Shemash was the only messenger sent from above to your planet who by his holy labor succeeded in creating conditions in which for a certain time the existence of its unfortunate beings somewhat resembled the existence of three-brained beings with the same possibilities that inhabit other planets of our great universe and this saint was also the first who, for the accomplishment of the mission assigned to him, refused to employ the customary methods established during centuries by all the other messengers from above for the three brain beings of that planet. The very saintly Ashiata Shemash taught nothing whatever to the ordinary three brain beings of the earth nor did he preach anything to them, as was done before and after him by all the other messengers sent from above with the same aim. And in consequence of this, none of his teachings in any form passed from his contemporaries even to the third generation there, let alone to contemporary beings. Definite information relating to his very saintly activities did, however, pass from the contemporaries of the very saintly Ashiata Shemash to the beings of following generations through those known as initiates, by means of a certain legomanism of his deliberations under the title of the terror of the situation. In addition to this, there has been preserved from the period of his very saintly activities, and exists even to the present day, a marble tablet, on which were engraved his counsels and commandments to the beings of that time. And this tablet, which has remained intact, is now the most precious sacred relic of a small group of initiated beings called the Obogmic Brotherhood, whose place of existence is in the middle of the continent of Asia. The name, Obogmic, means, there are no different religions, there is only one God. On my last visit in person to the surface of your planet, I happened to become acquainted with this legomanism, which transmitted to the initiated beings of remote generations of the planet Earth the deliberations of the saintly Ashiata Shemash under the title of, The Terror of the Situation. This legomanism was of great help to me in elucidating certain strange aspects of the psyche of these peculiar beings, which until then I had been unable to understand at all, in spite of my careful observations of them during tens of centuries. Dear, beloved grandfather, tell me, please, what does the word, legomanism, mean? asked Hassane. Legomanism, Beelzebub replied, is the name given to one of the means used there for transmitting from generation to generation information about certain events of long past ages through those three brain beings who have become worthy to be, and to be called, initiates. This means of transmitting information had been devised by the beings of the continent of Atlantis. For your better understanding of how information can be transmitted to beings of succeeding generations by means of legomanism, I must tell you a little about those beings whom other beings they're called, initiates. In former times on the planet Earth, this word was used in one sense only those three brain beings were called 
initiates, who had acquired in their presences almost identical objective data, which could be sensed by other beings. But during the last two centuries this word has come to have two different meanings. According to the first meaning it is used, as in the past, to designate those beings who become, initiates, thanks to their personal, conscious labor.